we're going to talk about in this series is, I believe, the most important subject. What I was just sharing there with Andrew in the interview, I believe with all my heart. If there is a God, and if there is a purpose to life, we all know we're here for a limited time, then really there should be nothing more important than discovering what is that plan, what is that purpose, and then aligning our lives accordingly. Especially if it's true that you could be prepared for the future in this world and the possibility of living forever. I think that's worth looking into. So in our time together during these meetings, we're going to really be talking about what I think is the most important thing in the world. Uh, maybe I should share just a little bit uh, about where I'm coming from. It was alluded to in the, um, in the interview there, and you probably have questions. Cave? What is he talking about? Uh, another night I'll tell you in more detail, but quick, uh, shortened version. Uh, I was raised, mother's Jewish, father, well, he was uh, raised Baptist, but basically an atheist by the time I came along. He was a pilot in World War II and saw a lot of death and pretty much said, if there's a God, how could he allow all that suffering? And so I was raised atheist, agnostic, went to 14 different schools, got into trouble like a lot of young people, got involved in the hippie movement, ran away from home, and uh, by, I started looking for purpose in nature. I thought maybe God was in nature. So I, again, I'm condensing this. I moved up into a cave when I was uh, 17 years old. I first found it when I was 15. And someone left a Bible in the cave. I started reading, and uh, that's when everything began to change for me. And since then, until today, I mean, God has just opened incredible doors where I've traveled all over the world and uh, have been sharing the information that I'll be sharing with you during this seminar. I think that the intelligent, logical thing is to believe in God and to believe the prophecy is real. I believe that it's practical, and I think that we can provide evidence for it. And so that's something we're going to be doing during this series here. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, prophecies in the future and going through a whole panorama of some of the Old Testament and New Testament prophecies that deal with what is coming. And so um, I want to make sure that we're synchronized. The time is ticking away. In this series here, we're going to be dealing with the principles of prophecy. And just to understand that, now see, I don't believe that you need to go to school for 10 years to be able to understand the basics of Bible prophecy. I think that God intended it so that everybody can understand. It does require a little bit of study, but um, if I can understand it, I think anyone can understand it. But you have to understand some of the basics. And let's face it, I'll be the first to admit there's a lot of confusion and a lot of disagreement among the religions in the world. And even in the, um, even in the Christian world, there's so many strange ideas out there regarding prophecy that uh, it just really confuses people. And so I think that there is a way where you can know for yourself that there doesn't need to be all of this confusion, this kaleidoscope of different ideas. You can know with some certainty, and there can be agreement on what does the Bible say about prophecy, and is it true? So um, we're going to be understanding some of the principles of pro prophecy. Now, ancient Egypt is very intriguing. I, I've been there before. I remember going in the Great Pyramid. You can't anymore. But just the incredible genius that went into that civilization is uh, so fascinating. But what most people don't know is that for 1,500 years, the history of this incredible defining culture was a mystery because all of the history of ancient Egypt was written in these cartoon-like pictures called hieroglyphics and they had lost the understanding of what those symbols mean. Uh, the Arab people that live in Egypt now are not the same people that built the pyramids. And so all of that knowledge, that language, that technology, the history, it was all gone. And it remained a mystery for 1,500 years. Then, in 1798, Napoleon went to Egypt, and he brought with him oh, about 30,000 soldiers and scientists and linguists and, and architects. And while some of his soldiers were doing some renovation of a fort in Rosetta near Egypt, 
They unearthed a stone that was about four feet approximately, a little more, by a little more than two feet, by about 11 inches thick, black basalt stone. And it had an inscription on it in three different languages. It had the more modern Coptic Egyptian. It had Greek. And there it had those ancient hieroglyphic symbols. And someone thought, I wonder if this is the same text and if it can be understood, if you could decipher the hieroglyphics from the other two. Well, they brought it back to France and a brilliant young Frenchman, Jean Francis Champion, this fella, by the time he was 16, could speak 12 languages. He had mastered them. He worked on it for a few years and through the art of cryptography, he cracked the hieroglyphics. And all of a sudden, these symbols that were all over ancient Egypt began to unfold and the history of ancient Egypt unfolded. And at that time, they found out that it was corresponding perfectly with Bible history. So it added a great deal of credibility to the Bible as a history book. And to this day, uh, even those who may not believe the Bible prophecies believe that the history in the Bible is some of the most dependable that they have in existence today. We're going to be looking at two of the main apocalyptic books in the Bible, one in the Old Testament, one in the New, that have a lot of very interesting prophecies. The book of Daniel and Revelation, they really ought to be studied together because there's a lot of similarities between the two. But people get confused. And I remember the first time I read through the book of Daniel, and it talks about these beasts with seven heads and ten horns and this large metallic image and, and these dreams and these animals. And you're going, what does that mean? And then you get to Revelation, and it's just as interesting. And it's got a woman riding on a beast that's like a lion and like a leopard and like a bear. And uh, everyone's wondering, what do these things mean? Well, you can understand. The key to understanding Bible prophecy is in the Bible. For example, out of the... Um, oh, oh, one more thing I want to mention to you before we get... I'm jumping ahead of myself here. I like to teach people using a question and answer format. Uh, if not for you, for me. Because there's certain points that I want to make sure and cover. And so I ask a lot of these very basic loaded questions and then we answer them. And it also, if you're like me, I kind of think sequentially and uh, it's the Socratic method of teaching. Jesus used this also. You ask questions and then you answer them. And our minds store things that way. So as I go through these presentations, I'm going to be giving you uh, the material in a question-answer format. In addition, we also have some follow-up material we'll be sharing with you because you might be thinking, boy, he said so much tonight. Where were those references? I don't remember all of that. You'll be hearing more about some lessons that we give you that have an outline containing a lot of the same material that I'm presenting. So I, and they're illustrated. I think you'll find that very interesting. First question is, what is prophecy? Let's look at a definition. If we're going to be studying Bible prophecy, if you look, for instance, in just the American Heritage Dictionary, prophecy is an inspired utterance of a prophet viewed as a revelation of divine will. The second part of that uh, definition, prophecy is a prediction of the future made under divine inspiration. Just giving you a little backdrop. But the world has a lot of very strange ideas about what prophecy is and what the purpose of it is. Today as I was walking around town, I went into your subway. Do you call it a subway? In England they call it a tube. I don't know what you call it here in Sydney. But they had all these stores. You got a virtual underground city. I was amazed. Across the street from my hotel, I went down in your subway, and it's just this maze of streets and corridors, and you can pop up in different parts of Sydney like a mole and go back down again. And, <laughs> and while I was down there, they had, uh, uh, there's a magazine store. And so I thought, I wonder if they got some of the same supermarket tabloids is what we call them. It usually deals with movie stars and crazy news. And you know, they're some of the most popular magazines in North America. I don't know about here, but a lot of them deal with prophecy because they found whenever they put prophecy on the cover, they sell. Because as I was sharing with uh, Brother Gary a moment ago, if it's true that somebody knows the future, just think about it. They'd be the most powerful person in the world. You could predict who's going to win the next uh, football game or race meet or the stock market and 
or what country would be winning a war. I mean, if, if prophecy was true, and if someone could know that, we all feel so helpless because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And that's why we all yearn to want to know, does someone really know? Is there a plan or is it all just a big accident? And you think about it, if prophecy is true, in order for somebody today to say what's going to happen one day from now, you know how many events interact, how many molecules and sound waves and how many things have to line up perfectly for someone to predict an event a day from now? That's a lot of power. And if someone can predict what's going to happen exactly a hundred years from now, or a thousand years in the future, that means there is a perfect plan because every atom and molecule has to line up in order for those things to happen. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? This is a seminar. You can nod. It won't, it won't bother me. Well, people want to know what the future holds, and so everyone's asking about prophecy. And some people claim to know, and they, they exploit prophecy. They capitalize and they sell it. We have these stations in the States where you dial a phone number, and uh, you can get information on prophecy. Uh, and they'll, they'll tell you prophecy over the phone. Of course, the first thing they ask you is, can we have your credit card, please? And I've got a friend, he called one of these numbers, and they said, okay, then welcome to the Prophecy Hotline. Can we have your credit card, please? And he says, well, the first test is if you have prophecy, you tell me what my credit card is. He <laughs> says, then we'll go to the next question. I was preparing for a seminar like this, and uh, we've got some people in the bigger cities that have these establishments where they say, you know, we'll read your palm, we'll tell your future, we're psychics. And... I stopped at one place because I take a lot of my own pictures for these presentations and I'm taking the picture of this uh, purple building where a psychic ostensibly operates. And while I'm out front taking a picture, the proprietor got nervous and she came out and she said, what are you doing? I said, well, you're a prophet, you tell me. No, I didn't say that, but I thought about saying that <laughs> because... <laughs> and one more thing, as soon as somebody says, we'll give you a prophecy for money, I'd be suspicious. Because in the Bible, you never find where a prophet gives an invoice. Matter of fact, you cannot um, find an example in the Bible where a prophet says, look, I'll give you a prophecy from God, but it's going to cost you this much. One prophet started to do that, and he died. His name was Balaam. Another guy started going down that road named Judas. Um, I hope you'll discover during this seminar we're not doing this to see how much money we can raise. We're doing it because we believe this is the truth. People are sponsoring so that others can hear what they believe the truth is. We believe that this is the most important information. And so um, let's go to the next question then. And all these psychics and people are reading their um, you know, horoscopes. I don't know if you have those in the paper here. And looking for some purpose. Even some folks get excited out of a fortune cookie because they're trying to find, is there some meaning? Uh, they're always looking for signs and symbols and what is the purpose because they feel out of control. Question number two, how important is it to study Bible prophecy? Yeah, it's very important. Let's see what the Bible says about the priority. In Amos chapter 3 verse 7, surely the Lord God does nothing until he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophet. Meaning, whenever there's anything of significance that's going to happen in history, God always seems to send somebody in advance to warn and prepare. When the world was going to be destroyed by a flood, God raised up a prophet named Noah to tell people. Before the children of Israel came out of Egypt and all those plagues fell, God raised up a prophet named Moses. Before the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, God raised up actually a spectrum of prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and others, to warn before Christ came, John the Baptist came as a great prophet to prepare the way. And through history, God has raised people up to help others know what is coming. So the Bible says there are holy men and women of God that he has called that reveal these things. Uh, next one is in 2 Chronicles 20.20. 20. The Bible says, believe his prophets and you will prosper. Now this is Another time I'll talk more. Matter of fact, tomorrow night I'm going to talk more about how do you know between a true and a false prophets. A lot of false prophecies out there, and God actually gives some criteria in his word so you can know how to discern between the two. But if you believe the true ones, you'll prosper. God speaks to prophets in a variety of ways. Sometimes it'll be through a dream, 
when Joseph got a dream from the angel about Jesus and Mary, uh, sometimes he'll speak through a vision. Uh, sometimes and it's like a three-dimensional dream where you're up and around. And he might speak through angels. A few times God gave prophecies like to Abraham face to face. And so he speaks to his prophets through a variety of ways. Interest in prophecy has not been decreasing. It's been growing. I remember in 1999 I went to New York City. I've already met some of you who saw that series. We broadcast live from Manhattan. Talk about interest in prophecy. Just before the year 2000 when uh, people had millennial fever and New York City was just absolutely mad during that time. Not only that, the the Mets were playing the Yankees. Hillary Clinton was running for the Senate and they were having a marathon. And uh, it was 1999 and people thought Y2K was going to end the world. Any of you remember Y2K? Did you have any? That's what you call the mother of all false alarms. Y2K. Another example of a false prophecy. But great interest in last day prophecy. Have we gotten over that now that we've got over the hump of that millennium and we're into a new millennium now, people don't care about prophecy anymore? Oh, no. Especially with things that are happening in the world, it's as large as ever. How many of you have heard about uh, 2012 or the Mayan prophecies, the Mayan calendar? And they've unearthed some stones. It's supposed to reveal, according to the Mayan calendar, that uh, the world is going to end on the winter solstice of 2012. And I understand they've even released or produced a movie on this. It's got a lot of uh, pictures and images of the world ending. There are a lot of sort of apocalyptic movies where the world's being destroyed. New York always gets destroyed in those movies, too. <laughs> Everything from Godzilla to asteroids to the tidal waves and just... Uh, oh, New York always gets slammed. But... Um, People are worried. And you know, these things sell because folks have kind of an inner sense. Uh, last year, yeah, I think there's actually a picture of me. My wife took this, and I wish that uh, Karen and the boys could be here with us, but they're in school right now. But uh, we were in uh, Belize, Central America, last year, went exploring some of the Mayan rooms, and I, I had a, a ride with a Mayan Indian, and I asked him about these prophecies. And he said, oh, you know, he said, none of the Mayan Indians believe that. He said, some archaeologist got a hold of it. And he says, we got hundreds of calendars. They're all different. But, you know, folks get very excited. And there's a popular preacher in North America. He's actually got stations all over the world. He's saying that it, the world's going to end in 2011. And how do you know? Does anyone know a day and an hour? Well, I'll talk about that tomorrow night. There's still great interest in prophecy. Now, some of the statistics I have here, I don't have my Australian statistics, but I've got some from North America. They did a survey right around the turn of the millennium, and 61% of the people in the United States believe that Jesus would return to the earth soon. 59% believe the world would come to an end soon. 53% believe events in this century have fulfilled some sort of Bible prophecy. How do we know that? Look at the books that sell. One of the best-selling series of books in the last century was this Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye. And by the way, he was also in the... Oh, no, I did a National Geographic series where they interviewed Tim LaHaye also about the, uh, the last day events. And people want to know. Even though the book is stated as fiction, it dealt with some of the Revelation prophecies. Great interest in that. We had the American Prophecies, same author, Beyond Iraq. These are bestsellers, The Bible Code. And they had The Bible Code, too, because the number one sold so well. That's where they take the, uh, the scriptures in Hebrew, they put them in a computer, they look for patterns, and they s say they found these patterns that foretold all these major events in history, uh, assassinations and the fall of the towers and things like that. And that was a popular book. And then there's been the Dan Brown Fever with a series of his books, The Da Vinci Code, The Last Disciple. I was going through the airport recently and I saw just stacks and stacks of his latest book called The Lost Symbol. All of these books are dealing with Bible, religious, Christian or Catholic prophecies and, and uh, been great interest in that. A little bit of fact mixed up with a lot of fiction, but people are fascinated with that. They're still looking for some kind of purpose. Bernard McGinn, 
a specialist at the University of Chicago Divinity School said, over the last 30 years, more scholarship has been devoted to apocalyptism, last day events, than in the last 300 years. So what do you think? Has interest in Bible prophecy accelerated? I think the answer is yes. Question number three, can Bible prophecy be trusted? Can we trust it? Well, I think that uh, there's good evidence that you can, and that's why I stand before you. I think it's logical. Isaiah chapter 42, God says, I am the Lord. New things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them with great accuracy. And again, in Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10, I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done. God is not limited in his ability to foretell the future where he says, well, look, I can tell you, you know, like the weatherman, sometimes he'll give you tomorrow, and he'll give you a guess for a week, and then the extended forecast, he's just shooting into the clouds, right? Pardon the pun. But God doesn't say the further out it gets, the less accurate I am. God can be 100% accurate a thousand years away because he's God. It's nothing for him. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. Again, in Joshua chapter 23, after the book of the five books of Moses, when the children of Israel finally enter the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, he makes this statement. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls, not one thing has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass not one word of them has failed. Everything God foretold through Moses regarding the children of Israel, that they'd get into the promised land, that what they'd encounter, their ups and downs, it all happened. And that's, that's a prophecy that goes back to the sixth book of the Bible. There's an awful lot since then that has also been fulfilled. Jesus said, if you believe him, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. And everything Jesus said has come true. That's Matthew 24, verse 35. You know, one of the things that really convinced me about Bible prophecy when I was up there in the mountains living in a cave was found in Daniel chapter 2. And about 600 years before Christ, Daniel spoke to one of the famous kings, he's in your history books, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had a dream. And this dream of this large idol made of various kinds of metal, head of gold, chest of silvers, a belly and thighs of bronze or brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay, and then out of the mountain, or out of the sky, this stone cut out of a mountain without hands, strikes it on the feet, it's pulverized, and the stone grows into a great mountain. And the king doesn't understand the dream. Daniel eventually is brought before the king. He interprets the dream. And in that dream, he outlines the history of the major kingdoms of the world the kingdoms that would principally have occupation or influence over God's people. And he does it in perfect order and the way that it happened in the history books. And he did it 600 years A.D. And we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls that uh, Daniel said these things before they happened. He said that Babylon would be a world empire, but it would fall, and the Medes and the Persians would take power, and that's exactly what happened. And they would fall, and even in the Bible it mentions Greece by name. And they were just a small group of tribes back then. And Daniel foretold it would be a world empire. And we all know about Alexander the Great. And then it would fall to the next kingdom of iron, which was Rome. And then that kingdom wouldn't completely fall. It would sort of disintegrate and be iron mixed with clay. I'll talk more about that another night. And all of it happened just the way Daniel foretold. And the last part of his image is this stone cut out of a mountain which represents Christ, the rock of ages, and his kingdom that will last forever. It all happened. I believe it's all still going to happen. Some of it's still in the future. For instance, there are over 300 Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah that have been perfectly fulfilled. And I think I've got a list of a few of them here in my Bible. For me, this was very important because you heard me mention that um, I come from a Jewish background, and it was very hard for me to accept that Jesus was the Messiah. As I said in that interview with Andrew Denton, I still consider myself a Jew. Um, you can be a Christian and be a Jew. Jesus was, right? Was he both? <laughs> and so I don't have to give up being Jewish to, uh, to be a Christian. But when I found in the Old Testament, and let me just 
give you a little visual picture here right now. When you talk about the Bible, you've got your New and your Old Testament, and three quarters of the Bible, roughly. Here we go. You got New Testament. This is once Christ came. You've got the Old Testament. This is approximately um, almost three quarters or three fifths of the Bible is the Old Testament. A lot of the Old Testament foretold what it would be like and how they could identify when God became a man, the Messiah, when God would come to the earth in the form of a man. And I said, ah, oh, that can't be. Couldn't be Jesus. There's been so much war and problems in his name. And then I started studying these prophecies. Over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament before Christ ever came. Again, we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls they were written before he came. And it told with great detail, for instance, what town he would be born in. Of all the towns, it said he'd come from Bethlehem. That's in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. It said he would come from the line of King David, which he did. That's in 2 Samuel 7, 16. Here's a, a shortened list of what I'm telling you now. That he'd be born of a virgin. I mean, that doesn't happen that often. That was foretold. Isaiah uh, chapter 7, 14, also in Matthew chapter 1, is the fulfillment that he'd spend time in Egypt, Hosea 11, verse 1, that um, there would be an attempt to murder him as a baby. That's also foretold in uh, Jeremiah 31, 15, that he would teach in parables, that he'd be betrayed by a friend, Psalm 41, how much he'd be betrayed for, and that it would be silver. And we know about Judas selling him for silver, Zechariah 11, verse 12, that he'd be crucified, they didn't even use crucifixion when King David foretold that in Psalms 22. That they would gamble for his clothing. I mean, how could you foretell something like that? Could Jesus, you know, Jesus might be able to say, well, I know there's a prophecy in the Old Testament about the Messiah riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. I'm going to do that and then say I'm the Messiah. You might be able to force the fulfillment of one of those prophecies. But how could Jesus get the Roman soldiers to gamble for his clothing? You think he set that up? that none of his bones would be bro uh, broken, that he'd be buried in a rich man's tomb, he'd be crucified between thieves. The year of his ministry beginning and his death are foretold in Daniel chapter 9, that he'd rise the third day, and I could go on and on and on. There's over 300 prophecies. What are the chances of that? Dr. Peter Stoner, former chairman of the Department of Mathematics, Astronomy, and Engineering at Pasadena College in California, he worked with 600 students for several years applying the principles of probability to the prophecies of the Messiah's first coming. They chose eight of the hundreds of available prophecies and using the mathematic probabilities, they decided the chances of all eight of those prophecies being fulfilled in one man's lifetime was one, and I don't know what that number is, someone there can tell me later, but it's 33 zeros. That's a totally uh, impossible, impossible uh, number. It, it would never happen. And yet still some people think that, um, was Jesus the one? You know, I saw that and I thought, you know, I have no choice. If I'm going to just use any kind of logic, it could never happen by accident. Jesus had to be the Messiah. Question number four. What else can we expect from the careful study of Bible prophecy? Some of the things that I hope that you'll anticipate during this presentation. First of all, be prepared to receive a blessing. The Bible says, blessed is he, and this is in Revelation, book of prophecy, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keeps the things that are written therein, for the time is near. Now some people think that, oh, I don't want to read Revelation. It's got all these scary plagues and wild monsters in there. Something might happen to me. I've had people come to a seminar like this and they came up to me trembling afterward. I remember this one couple and they looked at each other and they said, we were told not to come here because there's a curse on anyone who studies Revelation. People hear all these crazy ideas, but actually Jesus said in the beginning of the book, there's a blessing pronounced on it. The word revelation means a revealing. God's wanting to reveal these things. He's not trying to hide it to us, but there's some digging that needs to go on. There, there is some research. God wants you to invest. He says, seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be opened. Ask and you'll receive. He wants to know, do you want me? I mean, we all want to be wanted, don't we? And those of you who are married, 
Men, in case you didn't know, women like you to show the initiative that you want them, that you appreciate them. Everybody wants to be wanted, even God. He's not going to force his love on us. He wants to be sought. And they say that uh, when a man is courting, ladies play hard to get because they like being pursued, like being sought. God says, you'll search for me, Jeremiah 29, 13. You'll search for me, and you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. If what I'm saying is true, if this fellow up on the stage is not a lunatic, I mean, after I said I lived in a cave, you're probably wondering. But uh, I always wonder, should I mention that the, the first night? But if what I'm saying is true, then nothing is more important than finding out. Uh, eternity depends on that. And that's why, by the way, I've come all the way from California to share these things with you. I hope those of you who live in the Sydney area, you will come. I promise I've come farther than you. And so I really hope you'll come to the ongoing series of meetings. But there's a blessing promise for you. Question number five. Why does some prophecy seem so difficult to understand? If God wants to say something, just say it. Why is it so difficult? The answer, Luke chapter 6, verse 10. I'm sorry, Luke 8, verse 10. And he said, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it's given in parables. Why? That seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Why would Jesus give these prophecies in parables so people might not understand? Well, for a few reasons. Virtually all of the difficult or symbolic Bible prophecies are given while there was a war going on or the children of Israel were occupied. Daniel had his prophecies. They were captive in Babylon. Ezekiel, captives in Persia in Babylon. When um, John had his prophecies, he was imprisoned by Rome. Even Jesus, they were occupied by Rome when they gave their prophecies. So in order to protect some of these prophecies, by the way, the prophecies often talked about the um, deterioration or the fall of these kingdoms. And that was considered treasonous. So some of them, to protect them, were put in these symbols. And God also wants us to search. I mean, don't you enjoy finding something when it's hidden? Uh, you probably don't get excited about finding your car keys if they're where you left them every day. But if you lose your keys and then you search for them, aren't you happy when you find them? That happened to me today. I locked myself. You know, we don't have this back in the States where when you walk into a hotel room, you stick your key in your wall to turn on the power. It's really clever, but we're just not used to that. So I walked out of my door today and forgot to take my key out of the wall. We don't stick our keys in our wall and, and to get our power in the States. So I had to get someone to open the door for me. I was hoping I didn't leave my key somewhere. You know, I, uh, I lived for about a year and a half on the Navajo Reservation. And, uh, I, well, I, I lived there when I was 16. I came back uh, doing some mission work again when I was in my 20s. And I had a lot of Navajo friends that during World War II were code operators. You see, the Japanese broke every American code during World War II. Um, and so someone suggested, why don't you get some of the Native Americans that speak Navajo? It's the largest tribe. And their language is one of the most difficult languages in the world. And have them be the radio operators so whenever any message is transmitted, have the Navajos talk to each other in their language and then they'll give the message over in English. And not only that, have them give the message to each other in code. So not only was it in Navajo, it was Navajos talking to Navajos in code. And bless their hearts, the Japanese tried as hard as they could. They could never figure out what in the world they were saying because it is such a, a guttural, complicated language. Well, in the same way, because there's a war going on, God has given these messages with symbols. And that's what the Navajos would often do. They'd talk to each other and they'd say, there's three turtles coming over the hill. Well, those were tanks. They knew what they were talking about. God gives the symbols in the Bible. He gives the answers. So uh, question number six. We're going to help find out tonight what is a method for understanding these. How can I understand the secret code of Bible prophecy? Answer, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find, knock, and it will be open to you. And again, it goes on to say, if anyone wants to do his will, he will know concerning the doctrine. Are you willing to do what God wants? If you've got an open heart and you say, Lord, I want to know, is this true? He'll then reveal it to those that have open hearts that are willing. Again, 
Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. That's 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. The natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they're spiritually discerned. Number seven, what is the central theme of all Bible prophecy? Some people think the central theme of Bible prophecy is the, the beast or monsters or plagues. The central theme is actually a person. It's Jesus. If you look, for instance, in the first verse, the first chapter of Revelation, it doesn't say the revelation of the beast. It's the revelation of Jesus. All these prophecies are telling us about Christ. And again, even Jesus said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures. These are they that testify of me. Christ is called the Word. The Bible is about a person. It's about God. The prophecies are ultimately telling us something about God. It's not trying to just, you know, uh, interest us with fascinating trivia. The Bible prophecies are really telling us about an individual, the most powerful, wonderful being in the cosmos, and it's God. And again, in John 14, 29, and now I've told you before it comes to pass that when it does come to pass that you might believe. Another reason God gives us prophecy is because once a prophecy is fulfilled, we're a lot more inclined to believe. Let me give you an example. All right. Get your attention right now. Let's suppose I told you that I could fly right now, that I'm going to flap my arms and I'm going to levitate. Let me just see your hands. How many of you believe me? I appreciate your confidence. All right. But now I want you to use your imagination. Let's pretend that right now I start to flap real hard. And you see me, use your magic, you see me get off the ground, no cables, and I come back down. You'd be impressed, but you'd probably think, what kind of trick is that? And then I said, okay, well, I'm going to snap my fingers and I'm going to disappear. And you'll hear a snap and then I'll reappear. All right, now use your imagination. I did that, you don't see me, and I did it, and I'm back again. Would you be impressed? You'd still be wondering what kind of trick it is. But let's just suppose I did about 20 things like that. Somewhere along the way, if I continue to do these incredible things that I said I can do, you're going to begin to say, well, yeah, maybe he can. Because I'm giving you evidence. You see what I'm saying? As I read through the Bible, the evidence continues to compound that God doesn't know what's going on. Somewhere along the way, if we're intelligent, unless we think he's just tricking us all, we're going to say, maybe he is God. Maybe there is a plan. Maybe he does know. So when we see the prophecies being fulfilled, God says, if you believe the prophecies, maybe you'll believe the other things I say about, I love you, I want to save you, you can live forever. So prophecy is also there to build our confidence in the other things in the Bible. 30% of the Bible roughly is prophecy. But it's there to help us know about that other 60% that's there, or 70%. Uh, so number eight. What is the key to understand the code of prophecy? We're going to try this out in just a moment. Compare Scripture with Scripture. Don't read anything by itself. Precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Make sure that it all fits together. Any scientist that is testing a theory compares experiments so that you get the same results. So to compare the Scriptures, the Bible is one book. And by the way, the Bible is written three different continents over 1,500 years, about 40 different authors, all different backgrounds, and yet even though they did not consult together, it's got the same central theme. That's incredible. There's no other book like that. That's why it stood the test of time, and you were nice enough to put one in my hotel room. I really appreciate that. Out of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, about 276 of those verses are found other places in the Bible. For example, Oh, one more thing. The meaning of the prophecy symbols are hidden throughout the scriptures. So if you want to understand Bible prophecies and what these symbols mean, they're given in the Bible. Number nine, what are some of the examples of the prophecy symbols and their meaning? All right, for instance, you look in Revelation, and it says that Jesus appears, and in, it, in his hand he's got seven stars. Out of his mouth is going a two-edged sword. And his countenance was shining like the sun in its strength. Now, how many of you really believe that Jesus has a sword coming out of his face? Or is that a symbol for something? What does it mean? Look in the Bible, and it'll tell you, for instance, in Hebrews chapter 4, 12, and the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So the sword coming out of Jesus' mouth, what does that represent? 
Word of God. And again, Ephesians 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In the Bible it says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. So you ought to have a couple, three scriptures to make sure that you can depend on something. So compare scripture with scripture. When you read in Revelation chapter 4 about this lamb that is slain in the throne, what does that mean? There's a dead lamb on a throne? Well, you read where John the Baptist points to Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So when you read in Revelation about the Lamb in chapter 4, who is the Lamb? It's Jesus. So you start to plug in what these symbols are and all of a sudden these prophecies all begin to make perfect sense. Now we're going to do one real quick together. Uh, if, now I'm just going to give you the answers here and you can look up the references. In Bible symbols, a woman represents, what does it say up there? church. How many of you have heard that before? Let me see your hands. Okay, that's a pretty, these are pretty basic. That bread represents the Word of God. Jesus said man doesn't live by bread alone. You've heard that before. Clothing represents character. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they discovered their nakedness and God gave them coverings because the fig leaves would not work. And the Son of Man in, in the Bible is Jesus. We've all heard that. Okay, let's assume these are accurate. Now you take a prophecy that you find in Isaiah chapter 4 verse 1. One verse. And it says, and in that day, seven women will take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own bread, and we will wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Well, what's a woman? Seven women is seven. It says a number from many churches. We'll take hold of one man, Jesus. But they say, we'll wear our own apparel, our own idea of righteousness, our own bread, our own interpretation, our own truth, but we want your name. We're going to call ourselves Christian. Do you see that happening in the world today? Where all these different churches, they all got their own idea of what the truth is, and they all disagree, but they all say they're Christian. Is Jesus that scattered and fragmented? The Bible foretold this would happen in the last days. So the key to understand Bible prophecy is the Bible. It helps you unlock the secrets. Now tonight's presentation is sort of divided in two parts. This last few minutes I want to talk to you about some signs that tell us that we're living in the last days. The first part was an introduction. If you were going to miss a meeting, you should have missed this one. Don't miss any more. Now we're going to really get into Revelation's final countdown and how we know we're living in the end times. Number 10. What are some of the prophetic signs of Revelation's final countdown that we are living in the last days? And I'm not setting a date. Jesus, shortly before he was executed, he was showing the temple to the disciples, or they were showing it to him because they said, isn't it beautiful? He said, don't get too excited about this building. He said, I'm telling you, there'll not be left here soon one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. That shook the disciples to the very core. And they came to Jesus later. And they said, tell us, Lord, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? So they want to know, what is the sign of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple? Signs of your coming and the end of the world. Christ then melds his answer together. But the first thing he says is, be careful. He says, there are going to be false Christs and false prophets. And have we already had them? There's a whole lineup of suspects that have claimed it. So there's a lot of counterfeits out there. The devil is trying to eclipse the true with all the counterfeits. So be careful. We'll talk about that more tomorrow. Jesus said there'd be wars and rumors of wars. Do we have that today? You know, just in the news. They're concerned about North Korea and its um, proliferation of nuclear tests and they're concerned about Iran and, and its uh, development of a, a nuclear weapon and uh, problems with missing weapons in different places. Uh, are people worried about wars and are there rumors of wars? Well, you say, Pastor, there have always been rumors of wars. There have always been wars. I mean, how does that make things different? Does a war today mean something different than it did a hundred years ago? Are weapons more devastating? I mean, in the last century we had two world wars. Man now has the capacity to destroy the planet with his war. So these wars are a little more foreboding than they have been in the past. I don't let these things worry me because I know what, how the prophecies tell us how it's going to end. It doesn't need to worry you either, but the world is generally worried. Jesus said, except those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. 
And so the Bible is telling us we don't need to be afraid, but if Christ doesn't come, there'll be nothing to come for because man will self-destruct. And then there's the problems with pollution. The Bible tells us that, uh, let me read this to you. In Revelation 11, verse 18, he says, you should destroy those who destroy the earth. That's an interesting prophecy because if you go back a hundred years, could man destroy the earth? I mean, if you know, you, it doesn't matter how many coconut shells you throw out there or banana peels or cannonballs, man couldn't destroy the earth with his swords and his bows and his arrows. But now not only with the weapons, but man with his pollution. Jesus foretold there'd be an increase in natural disasters in the last days. It says here, for instance, in Luke 21, verse 25, there'll be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Some wondered if that was an allusion to the tsunami that happened back in 2004. Men's hearts failing them for fear and the expectation of those things that are coming on the earth. And it says men's hearts failing for fear. What is terrorism? Isn't it a weapon that uses fear? I was listening to your news just the other night and worried about these asylum boats that maybe their terrorists could be sneaking on and acting like they're looking for uh, refuge. So everywhere in the world. Christ also foretold there'd be earthquakes in different places in the last days. We just read that. I got this off the U.S. National uh, Geological Survey website. These are the earthquakes in the last week, I think, 280 earthquakes are listed. You got quite a few just north of Australia there. Are they accelerating? Look at this here. You see where all of a sudden in 1993, it's fairly a flat line and it begins to go up. They're increasing in not only frequency, but in intensity. And I don't know how many days ago it was, they just had another major one in Indonesia and then a tsunami in American Samoa and um, it seems like things are shaking everywhere right now. You might think that's a picture of Australia. That's actually Los Angeles this year. Uh, this natural disasters and fires. You hear the news reporters sometimes they come on the air and you think they become religious because they say we're having a fire of apocalyptic proportions. We're having a dust storm of biblical proportions. It's interesting, they become very religious when they have natural disasters, these secular news reporters. Christ also foretold in the last days there'd be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. And he said all these are the beginnings of sorrows. A lot of people in the world today, and it, the number's not going down. 3.5 million people per year die of starvation. And uh, about, that's about 10,000 people per day. And the population continues to greatly expand and swell. There's more and more people. You know, I've got uh, another little bit of statistics here. I'll put this up on the screen for you to look at while I read this for you. Population of the world in 1 AD, 200 million. It took 1,800 years to get the first billion people. In 1804, there was one billion. 1927, that's only about 28 or 35 years or so, 2 billion. 1960, 3 billion. I remember when there were 3 billion. I feel old because now there's over twice that. 1999, 6 billion. Now we're pushing 7 billion, 6.9 right now. They figure by 2020, there's going to be 8 billion. Look at the problems we have now and begin to uh, multiply that exponentially and you say, wow, no wonder people are apprehensive about the future. I'm glad that the future isn't totally an, an accident, that there's someone who knows what's coming and that there is a way to survive. And what I'm sharing with you during this seminar is that there is a plan. But I got more scary stuff. I'm not done yet. Pestilence. You've probably heard about the H1N1 uh, uh, flu or virus, and I don't know if uh, you've got the same issues here where they're giving vaccinations out and people are concerned about a pandemic. More people died during the 1918 pandemic than in World War I and World War II, or, than, or at least World War I, rather. From the 1918 pandemic, it was a flu. And they don't have answers for all of these things. 
And then Jesus also foretold in the last day that there'd be great violence. I don't know what it's like here in Australia, but in North America, you probably don't hear on the news that just on the eastern seaboard, more people die from gang violence than happening in all our military activities all over the world in one day. That's right. That's absolutely true. A lot more casualties from gang violence in North America on the eastern seaboard, New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C., than is happening with the military. But uh, you know, we hear about the war. And for me, one of the greatest evidences that the Lord is coming soon is the technology. It says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will increase. I'm, Honda's got this robot now. And I just heard a couple of weeks ago, Honda came out with a, a unicycle you sit on. It balances itself like the Segway, and you lean whatever way you want to go. I saw it demonstrated. It's just fascinating. I love technology. But you know, the Lord foretold that that would be one of the signs. There are people probably some who are here who remember when radio was a new thing. Uh, air travel, they, they used uh, gas lights or when they were in their home, and now people are zipping across the sky. The space station, the International Space Station, all these countries of the world's most expensive man-made thing in, the, un in uh, the world. Billions of dollars in technology. It's just absolutely phenomenal. And man has not even left the neighborhood when you think about how big the universe is. But the most convincing prophecy that Jesus gave for me, he said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, the gospel will be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. He didn't say everybody's going to convert or believe, but he said everyone would have an opportunity to believe. And now through satellite television, this is being recorded, and it'll be broadcast on satellite, radio, the internet, publishing, and all these other incredible technologies, there's nowhere you can go in the world right now where you don't have access to this message. It's just phenomenal. I've been in the jungles of Africa and seen people dressed in native attire, and they're on the internet, satellite the internet. They're in a cyber cafe. <laughs> it's amazing. And you see these poor street kids in India on the streets, but they'll go in and, I mean, they're wearing rags, but they're getting on the internet. And they understand how, to, just mind-boggling to me. And so through that medium alone, it's all over the world. All these signs are telling us that Jesus is coming soon. Now, I don't think anyone knows the day. Christ said, no man knows the day or the hour. We'll talk to you about that. You keep coming. No man knows the day or the hour of his coming, but you can know when that time is near. It says, and that's the next verse here, in Matthew 24, verse 33, we can know when it's near. And that's why we're doing this presentation, so we can know that it's near. And I think everybody here knows something's different about this generation. There's never been a generation like this before. You know, God is giving us signs in his word so that we can be aware. And it's very interesting that after the tsunami happened in 2004, I don't know, do you remember where you were when you heard about that 240,000 people dying in that cataclysm. And some of you might be thinking right now, if God's so good and if God's so loved, then why do all these innocent people suffer? We've got a presentation that's going to talk about that too, because that was my big question. If God's in charge, if he's powerful, then why do these catastrophes happen? And they've tried to put up a, an early warning system with these buoys around the Pacific Ocean so that they can have some kind of warning to prepare because people just feel so helpless, and it seems like nature, politics, economy, everything is out of control. But he doesn't want you to be worried, and I believe that's why he brought you here. And I want you to, if what I'm saying, give it a chance and find out. During this, uh, the last tsunami in Indonesia, the big one that happened in 2004, there was one gentleman who had lived in Hawaii that understood something about tidal waves because the shore where he lived, they occasionally had them. And when the volcano would shake and there was an earthquake, sometimes the tide would go out further than normal and that it would come back in with a tsunami. Well, he moved to Indonesia and he owned a resort there. And when they felt that 9.0 magnitude earthquake, 
he felt it shake. He looked out of the window and he saw the tide was going out with this unusually low tide. And all these thousands of tourists were on the shore in front of his resort and they said, oh look at that, we can go out there low tide and they're looking for seashells and starfish. And his parents with their kids were saying, oh look at this night, we can look for the shells. And that man knew what it meant. He knew that it was going to come back in force. And he went running out of the resort, went running up and back and forth on the beach. And he said, head for a high ground. There's a tidal wave coming. There's a tsunami coming. Get out of the water. Get up to the shore. And there was so much urgency and, and seriousness in his voice that people said, hey, maybe we better get out of here. And all the people left the water and they went up towards the resort and they went up towards higher ground because of his understanding of what the signs were and none of them perished well I'm telling you friends that God has given us signs in his words so we can know when the end is near and it is near the prophecies are all culminating you owe it to yourself if what I say has even a 50 percent chance of being true then there'd really be nothing more important than understanding what the future is and how you can prepare and perhaps there's a way that you could survive not only in this life but eternally that I think is really important and it'd give you a peace of mind just to have an understanding of what is going on in the world time is ticking away and God wants you to be ready and I'd like to just close this session you obviously know that I believe in the Word of God I believe in God I'd like to pray for you would that be okay would you please bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, I don't believe anything happens by accident, Lord, and that you've brought each one of these people here by a divine appointment. We believe that there is a plan, that the world is not just spinning without a, out of control with no purpose or design. And Lord, I would pray that you'd speak to every heart right now, that we'd open our hearts, and we'd make it a priority to seek, to ask, and knock, in the next few days of these presentations and to see if the Bible is true, to see if prophecy can be trusted and see what the big picture is. Most of all, that we might see and know you. We thank you and we ask this in the name of your Son. Amen.